So here's some of our objects. So for me, I'm gonna choose the house plant one because I am a plant collector. So it just matches my personality. Um, but when I'm looking at this image, I'm noticing that there's lots of new growth, but it also is still in a vase. And object as a metaphor. Does anybody else see um, an image here that they would like to describe about their current uh, mindset with teaching? I have to, I have to say something funny that there's a funnel here and I immediately <laughs> saw a martini glass that's <laughs> that was I was like oh yeah completely um but actually I am for the metaphor I am going to use the the newspapers um and the reason that that's elevating for me is I feel like the world is really what is what is happening in the larger world is really impacting teaching and learning spaces in what I would say a, a, a maybe a new and different way, whether you wanna talk about from the way COVID has changed our teaching and learning spaces, whether gun violence is changing our teaching and learning spaces. Um, it's really top of my mind right now of the image and idea of school as a very safe place as uh, a very sacred place and um, that that is not the lived experiences of many of our young friends. So that is that is the connection that I'm, I made in this moment. Great. Um, for me, I the the candle really resonates with me. I love the idea of light but also that it's it's kind of on its own. A lot of us, if we're in the arts, we're usually on our own where we're at, but also it seems like um, you are, you're constantly advocating for what you do and making people realize that, that what we do is not, I mean, not only fun and, and important, but also it's, it's essential for us as human beings and we, so often forget that, that we're creating human beings, not little machines. And um, just being that light that can um, not only spread that word, but like how learning can be joyful and how it can be um, meaningful for everyone involved. And even though we're teachers, we can still be learning and growing through the process and just being a light when it seems like everybody around you might be pulled down, especially as we get into testing season, just being um, like like a positive force in our in our world, in our building, in our in our little corner. So that that's what really um, resonated with me was the candle. I love that. Thanks for sharing. Is there anyone else that's connecting with anything? And it's okay if you choose um, an image that's already been picked by somebody else in the group. I was going to say the candle as well. Um, but what kind of jumped out to me at first was kind of the flame being the, just kind of the passion for like learning and teaching and all that. But then at the cost of like the flames going, but the candles melting. So just giving so much of yourself and losing some parts of that, you know, it's just, it's going to melt eventually. Yeah. 
And sometimes depending on what kind of candle you have, it could be, it could burn fast and sometimes it can burn slow, but that's a really powerful thing to be aware of too, that, you know, sometimes when we give, there's also that other, the other end. Charlie, are you okay if I read yours? I saw you posted something in the chat. Are you comfortable? Okay. Charlie said, I feel the newspaper is my connection as I think the world is changing and with social media and technology, we are having to make adjustments to help those with learning and retaining important information in a way that is different than the old school way of pencil and paper. And the art in the art room, art has changed to more technology and is blending into my room and I have to find a way to include it. And lots of lots of connections with, with the candle, so that's great. And the mirror being a reflective practice for both students and teachers. Great. Any other connections? Um, let's go ahead and quickly kind of reflect on that brief little warm up activity. Um, I have a variety of reflection questions here. I'm not going to read them all to you, but take a second to read it. See if there's a question that maybe speaks to you um, that you would like to reflect on. Um, again, this is coming from drama based pedagogy, um, and it was called object as metaphor. Wondering if anybody has any person like the the what part of the strategy was easy or difficult for you and why? I would say that um in reflecting that, and I think it's really interesting to think about this in terms of what students feel too, is that, I mean, you always want, like you want the right answer, even though it's your answer. <laughs> you want it to say, like that imposter syndrome thing that it's like, oh, did I choose the right one? Mm -hmm. um, and that might be just where I am today in, in this moment, but I think it's always good to remember in, in the safe, feeling the safe space of, uh, of being able to share and be open and be present. Yeah, this is totally a, a strategy that could, I mean, it took us what, five minutes. Um, it's something that could build that safe space where like at first it's a little uncomfortable, right? Um, but then the more you practice it and the more that students feel comfortable sharing out, and knowing that it is their answer and there really isn't any right answer or wrong answer, um, then the conversation kind of builds from there. And that's where you can kind of see it expand maybe into some of your content. Like, how could we use this with um, literature that we're doing right now? Like, what, how can we connect to character or mood? How can we connect to um, like mathematical concepts with geometry like there's different ways that maybe once you kind of have that safe space this could branch out into into other different areas i think that um giving us images made me think about like it didn't occur to me that i felt like a candle today <laughs> or you know uh, if you ask just a blanket question how are you feeling today um you know and even if you gave different Faces, but the fact that you gave these images with no context and, you know, allowed us to kind of, you know, maybe realize something about ourselves that we didn't realize when we came in the room. Like we may feel like a frowny face or a smiley face, but, you know, to pick these inanimate objects, I think um, allowed us to look, it allowed me to look more inward and um, connect with something that I hadn't even thought about connecting with today. Mm -hmm. The other thing I'd like to um, <clears throat> share 
as a as a teacher, sometimes I became impatient with the silence and the space. And I think that modeling that opportunity for wait time allows the pace to become slower and allows for that reflective thinking because we are in a in a typically in a feeling like we're in a time crunch that it's like question answer question answer question space reflect respond so thanks for modeling that lauren yeah yeah wait time can definitely be very uncomfortable um but it, i have found definitely especially in um arts activities or warm-ups or lessons um giving that time and 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 this is also a personal response too but i know i've been in a situation where somebody's presented something and like sometimes it's even just that pressure of like oh i should fill fill this space like i should say something and it, it it's taking that first risk and that first leap of faith to put yourself out there and to share something and then once you do that it kind of ripple effects right like oh like i noticed in the comments somebody was scared to choose an object because they didn't want it to seem silly or crazy. But then hearing that, oh, somebody else is also relating to the candle in this moment, or somebody else is also, you know, thinking about the funnel and maybe a post cocktail <laughs> that we did, you know, like how could it, how could it connect and how can we build that relationship with each other as a group? Um, so these are all very powerful um, thoughts you guys are having. So thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and move us along here. Before we jump into our um, our guest speakers today, just a quick reminder, um, you know, the reason we're here today is because we want our um, our network meet meetings to be about teaching through the arts and finding experiences and opportunities and ways to do that. Um, and this just lists all of the great, wonderful things that we know teaching through the arts can do for our students. Um, and so thank you guys for being here um, and, and, and being present with us. Um, this is something we're still kind of workshopping, um, but I do like to speak to it, especially in the last couple meetings, um, because I just want to reiterate that when we are teaching through the arts, that there is um, a continuum of this, and arts integration is one of the strategies, and I'm so glad to have Katie and Stephen here today to talk about how they align the standards, because that can be one of the most challenging parts of, of arts integration. Um, but there's also other ways that you can incorporate the arts. I mean, using our warm up, for instance, as a way to kind of get conversation going or just to quickly enhance a reading activity we're doing. Um, it, we're not spending a ton, ton of time talking about, you know, skills that we need to be actors and actresses, but we're using those concepts to help us um, engage in another lesson idea. So. This is just, again, something we're kind of like working through and working on and continually changing, um, but just reiterating that arts across the curriculum can look a lot of different ways. Um, and we encourage you to try and um, share the different ways that you have, have used your strategies. Before we jump in, um, what, just a quick discussion point, and since we have small group, um, please feel free to just unmute and share out. But in your experience, what are some of the most challenging pieces um, you have found in assessing in an arts integration approach? Um, one, one of the things I find most challenging sometimes is just like finding the time to do it, like trying to um, work the assessment piece into the project or into what we're working on because sometimes like i know this year our units are a little shorter like we shorten it down and so it's been a little bit challenging like before we had more time to do like a writing piece at the end or compose an artist statement and that was kind of the assessment piece and now like we've shortened our units by a few weeks and so like it's it, that i think sometimes it's just finding the time and consciously working it into like the every day, I think is, mm -hmm. is the challenge. I think, yeah, we jumped right on that because that's probably the most challenging for us, period. I 
I think for me, is when we start an arts integration project, I like having the openness of no, not having any idea what, where we're going to land. And I love the idea of just going deep and who knows what's going to happen, which means how do you assess the unknown? And, and then you get there and you're like, oh, I should have assessed that. Um, so being, being willing to put some boundaries so that you have something to assess, but I love the openness of it. And so I'm, yeah, assessment always, that's, that's where it gets me is I don't want to assess. I want to see what happens first and then assess. And then you're usually out of time by then. Right. <laughs> right. It's one of the things about engaging in a creative process, assessment, informal assessment, coaching happens constantly and it is not recorded constantly. When you walk by a student's desk and and they are using a pencil in a certain manner and you want to encourage them to experiment with different textures or something, you may make a comment and you've assessed their work in progress. Uh, I'm thinking visual arts right now. And you have made a coaching suggestion for them to consider, but you didn't go over to your grade book and give them a 4.2 on texture at that moment. And so differentiating between assessment, coaching, and reporting, and formal assessments, uh, I, I think is an important aspect. Because assessment happens lots more than we record. Yeah. I think that's a... Oh. Sorry. I, there was, I was just going to say, like, that's a good point you made. And, and like, it's more about the documentation than it is about. Yeah, and I agree. Formative. Formative I, is easy. I agree that, like, yeah, the assessment is ongoing as the project is ongoing. But for me, it's like, oh, once the unit is over, well, how do I prove to an administrator that we achieved our goal? You know, because I didn't record it or I didn't write it down. <laughs> Yeah, I was gonna gonna just bounce off of that as well. I think that's a, a really important point because like just that word assessment, I think as an educator can be like dun 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 because it's like, okay, we have to like prove to our administrator, make sure we're hitting all of these things, but it can be this more document documentation style kind of process where it's like I find as an arts integration teacher, like I know what I'm hitting and what standards I'm hitting. And yes, it's important to have that documented somewhere or written down somewhere. And I think Katie, what you said, where there's there's gonna be times where you have that specific outcome um, and you can you know, do that immediately, but there's gonna be other times where it kind of evolves and changes as you go. Um, and I don't want that to bog down people that they're not doing arts integration. Um, because they don't have that formal assessment piece, for example. But there are still ways to teach a content form, teach an art form together, um, and, and have it still be arts integration. I think when we get into that assessment piece, um, yes, it's important, but I also don't want it to weigh people down, if that makes sense. And I think people are bringing up a lot of great points here. Any other thoughts or feelings about using assessment in an arts integration approach? I think sometimes for my students, it is an issue of needing a rubric and then comparing up against their peers. So when they self-assess, they're comparing themselves rather than looking at the rubric and the skill that we're working on. Well, I'm going to let us go ahead and move on then to our um, guests for today, Katie and Stephen. Um, thank you so much for being here. I do have your slides, but I am going to stop because I think you guys want to run the show there. And then if you need me, uh, I can be your little backup. <laughs>
So not only was I asking if you could see our slides, I was muted while I was saying all that, sorry. Steve, can you see our slides though, we're good? Okay. Okay. All right, so uh, yeah, so I'm Steve Schistler. And I'm Katie Schistler. Yeah, and uh, we've, <laughs> we, uh, we work together at Stoll Elementary School and we have been doing arts integration for the last few years. Uh, slightly interrupted by COVID, but back at it again. Um, and so today we're going to be talking to you about aligning standards. Uh, and, uh, and that was something that we did as part of the um, arts integration and uh, or the Institute for Arts Integration and in STEAM. We, we did a certification program through them uh, last year. And so we're just going to share with you some of the things that we picked up from them um, about aligning the standards and uh, just kind of how we work on planning units with classroom teachers. Uh, yeah, because um, when we first started doing um, integration in general, we really had no idea what we were doing. And to be honest, we aren't experts. This is about our fifth year in doing it and we're still learning. We're we're just, you know, a few steps further. And so we just wanted to share you share with you the steps we've come to. and. Uh, everything that we learned or are sharing with you, we did learn from the Institute for Arts Integration. So we'll have that um, link later on in the presentation if that's something you're interested in doing. Um, and yes, we're going to look at aligning standards because it's everybody's favorite. When we think of standards, I think just like Lauren said with assessment, like I say assessment or standards and teachers eyes just glaze over like, oh, I mean, we just hate it. like every time. And um, even when we were doing this last night, Steve's like, I hate this so much. <laughs> we don't, because we're artists and we, we want to teach the human beings. But unfortunately, we need to look at the science of it because science is good too, right? They're equal. And um, so we're kind of looking at the science of teaching arts integration. The benefits of aligning standards will keep our objectives clear. Like I said, I'm somebody that likes to go deep. I like to go out into the unknown and see what happens. But if we have a standard that we've created, um, it keeps bringing us back so that when we start straying off, we, we come back to what is our goal? What do we want our students to be able to do? And so we keep coming back to that. And that's an important thing. Another thing, it is it does make it a lot easier to create assessment. You can create those rubrics. You can create um, the the summative that you're aiming for, so that the students can be um, aiming for that as they go through the lesson. As teachers, we can be aiming for that goal in the end, while still allowing them to be creative. It also makes lessons more meaningful, because um, yes, arts integration is fun but it's not just fun and it's not just enriching. It is so much more than that. And in order to get that message through, you've got to speak in the language that um, administrators uh, um, understand. And that's through that. It's a common language that, you know, your teachers, and I get this with teachers, oh, I can't sing, I'm not a musician. We'll let the kids do that. But I can't draw. I, can I, can't. Only, I can't even draw a stick figure. Yes. <laughs> but, but the thing is, you know, we're all artists. We're all musicians. And we've got to all get out of our comfort zone. I'm not a math teacher. But if I spend time with those standards and start seeing common language, I can identify with them more. And, uh, and I will go to a math teacher and say, what does this word mean? What is this? Or I'll look at a social studies standard. And, you know, it, it, it gives us a common language to discuss. And then, like I said, administrators love them. I don't think they really do, but it's what, what they will listen to if you're it's like- It's a language they can understand. Yes, it's a language that they can bring to their, their bosses and say, hey, our kids are accomplishing this. And um, it just helps us stay on the same page. So it's not the most exciting thing in the world. Um, and it might make your brain hurt a little bit, but if we can, learn uh, some steps through this, then perhaps we can create something even as a state, um, create a bank of arts integrated standards. Wouldn't that be exciting? 
And that might be something that comes up later in today's lesson. All right, so whenever I'm doing metaphors in my classroom, I always go to food. <laughs> uh, I know, I was so hungry looking at these images. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so, so here we have a cupcake and a jelly roll. And as we were talking about standards today, we're going to be using those a little bit. Um, and so I thought maybe just for a moment, if we could compare or contrast the two, like things that you notice that are either similar about the two or things that are are different about how, how they're made or how, uh, how they're consumed. <laughs> uh, if you, I mean, if you want to unmute yourself and just say, say whatever you feel about these two desserts. Well, I'm thinking about eating them, of course, and uh, the powdered sugar is going to get all over my shirt, but I'm going to get icing on my nose when I eat the other one. other thoughts about how these two desserts are different from one another? I feel like one I could probably eat like just in one bite and one I'd have to like cut apart in some way to kind of uh -huh. take more bites. Yeah. I would say one is for a kid's party or a treat and the other one is a dessert and decadent. Oh, ah. like fancy. Mm -hmm. One is more civilized. <laughs> no, precisely. I, I could see that. Um, yeah, so like with, uh, with cupcakes, I know at least whenever our kids at our school have birthdays, right? They're bringing around their cupcakes to yeah. all of our classrooms. And like, they always have like an obnoxious amount of frosting on top. And so like, you know, I'll, I'll, graciously take a cupcake from a student whose birthday it is, but sometimes I don't want to eat it just because it has so much frosting on it. Like I want to just take the frosting off and just eat the cake part because it's just so much. Um, or some people just like eating the frosting and not the cake, right? So like, so when we were going through our arts integration program, they were talking about standards that you want to jelly roll your standards because mm -hmm. if you if you try to combine a core standard and an arts standard together, but in a way that's sort of separate, like where you could have one without the other, then it's, it's not really as effective. So like if your standards are just sort of stacked on top of each other, like, you know, like singing a song to help you learn, you know, the 50 states and their capitals or something mm -hmm. like that, like it's not, it's, it's kind of like the frosting kind of like it's it's there to enhance the cupcake or it's not it's not you know it's kind of but it could be the two concepts could be separated mm -hmm. and taught separately so whenever they were talking about uh how we're supposed to mesh the standards together it's more like a jelly roll like if you just wanted to eat the jelly part of the jelly roll that's really messy that's not going to work very well um so so they're talking about jelly rolling the standards so that you basically have to engage in both the core and art standard at the same time. You can't like just cut the frosting off. You have to eat the whole thing. Yeah. Any thoughts on that? I am so stealing that. Oh, well, we it's stole not it. us. We stole it from, from uh, Again, the Arts yeah. Integration Institute. <laughs> so well, I will. I will steal the steal. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll steal it. We'll share it, share it with the world. Um, so yeah, so the goal is to not just be the icing on the cake, but be an inseparable part of the whole dessert. Yeah, that really changed our perspective. And this is how the Arts Institute showed us how to do it. And so here we're going to get into the nitty gritty of it. <clears throat> so cognitive skills, how we think. Um, I know our district uses DOK, which is the four levels. Um, this one splits it with Costa's level of questioning, which I don't see very often, um, depth of knowledge, and then Bloom's taxonomy, which is my personal favorite because it just dissects it even more. And this chart is not exhaustive, but it's pretty good. 
um, showing different verbs that are used. So like a level one, recall information or remember is the very simple stuff like memorizing something or uh, drawing something, identifying. You get into compare or retell um, with understanding. And those are very basic things that you have to do in kindergarten and first grade, but hopefully you can push it beyond that. And of course, our ultimate goal is to get to that top level of extended thinking of creating um, where you, you go beyond that. You're imagining things, you're producing things, you are, um, you're organizing things, you are designing, you're, you're going to that next level. And creativity is everything in arts. I mean, that is everything. So if we can push it over there, that's great. But also you'll see some of these words are multiple under multiple ones because you can analyze something and debate it, but maybe you can push the cognitive level a little harder to go to the next strategic thinking level where the debate is even deeper in how you research it. And using an art standard can bump it up a little bit. It can take that level one and maybe move it to a number three on the, on the uh, Bloom's taxonomy. Or you can take uh, a five and knock it up to a six. I personally love the creating element. For me, when I'm creating units with teachers, I really want to have creation in it and using musical concepts to create things, to show their knowledge, to show what's going on in them. So that's something I love to push for. And if we can use that with our standards, then we can possibly not only find standards that align, but make a better standard. And what administrator would not love that? That no, they're not only applying it, they are evaluating it. Now they are creating. They are, they're, their brain is working a lot harder. They can't go on autopilot here. They have to switch it on. So that's one of the great things. We're gonna look at a few of examples that we have that we've created. I think it turned out that they were both mine. I'm sorry. That's fine. Steve's are really good too. It's fine. But we'll talk about it. All later. right, so what we were trying to do in our coursework was to take a content standard and an art standard and bundle it together. So like we said, jelly roll. And um, you'll notice that on the art standard, I we highlighted the verbs. And we did this like when we were doing it too, just to kind of help visualize. So we highlighted the verbs that we saw in the standard. And then when we tried to combine the two standards together, we basically rewrote a new standard combining the, the actions in both of these. And when you do it to jelly roll it, instead of just, you don't want to have like all your red verbs stacked on top and all your blue verbs stacked on the bottom. You try to sort of interweave them into the standards so that it, you know, basically is difficult to remove. All right. Um, so like for this one, uh, the art standard is I don't know if I theater. can read it. Yeah, it's a theater, sure. theater standards at third grade. So use, which, or which? Yeah, it's third grade. Yeah. So use personal experience and knowledge to make connections to community and culture in a drama or theater work. And the content standard is describe how people in Missouri preserve their cultural heritage. And so then, now this is just a lesson C, it's not a complete lesson, but what one of our first projects that we did was just creating like 10 lesson seeds where we bundled a content standard and an art standard together. And this was just like a jumping off point for what you wanted the students to do. And then you could, some of those we, um, we then pushed into a, like a complete unit and other ones we just sort of left as the seed and maybe, maybe you know, we might come back to it someday. But as these two were combined then, uh, it reads, the student will make connections to community and culture in a drama theater work by a Missouri playwright by describing how the work preserves the state's cultural heritage using personal experience and knowledge. So 
we tried to bundle these together in a way where you just couldn't really take one out. Like you kind of have to have both um, for that to work. Yes. Um, here is one where the content, um, and I believe this is second grade, is develop and demonstrate reading skills in response to text by retelling a story's beginning, middle, and end by determining its central message, lesson, and moral. And um, I used a dance standard, improvise a dance phrase with beginning, a middle, that is the main idea, and a clear end. And already, not only did the verbs line up, but also you see the beginning, middle, end in both of them. You're going to find natural alignments um, between standards. But what, what we were taught to focus on is the verbiage. Improvise. Um, versus retelling and determining. Improvise can mean, you know, off the top of your head, but also the idea of retelling in a way is kind of an improvisation. You are retelling the story um, or improvising what you know about the story based on what you've learned about it. Because improvisation, you use the context of what you already know. And so, um, what I ended up writing was, uh, the student will determine the central message of the story and improvise a dance phrase with a beginning, a middle, that is the main idea and a clear end. The student will retell the story's beginning, middle, and end with the main idea dance phrase. They have just improvised. And so if you see that new, like we, it's kind of like a super, super sized um, standard. Yeah. You now you are not only covering one standard, you're covering multiple standards at once, and you they are inner they 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 have to stay together. There's no way that you can uh, dance without having the reading element. You cannot, you know, you can't retell it without having the dance element. It's it's got to be together. Um, also notice that both of those things. Um, I are not necessarily in our wheelhouse um, because I'm a music teacher. Steve is a visual arts teacher. Now I've, I've dabbled in theater and dance. And so I feel more comfortable with it. I think um, visual arts teachers will have the biggest challenge in the sense that I can take from theater and dance and music, all, all of them performance-based, but I would think as a visual arts teacher presenting an idea that has dance would be a little unnerving. It would take you out of your comfort zone. But I think that's another thing we have to look at is that as arts integration specialists, we need to be open outside of our subject, which is scary. And it's scary to me sometimes to present an idea to a teacher and it's really more visual arts than music because I'm the music teacher, that's what I'm here paid to do. But in order to make a, a, a natural alignment, visual arts might work better. And I need to admit, maybe music is not the, the best match for it. Um, I need to learn more about theater and dance. And, um, and that's, the thing is, general music te or general teachers are being pulled out of their element too. Like these, you know, I can't sing, I can't play, I can't uh, draw. Um, we have to allow ourselves to be pulled out of our comfort zone as well. Um, I, I think that that's a good experience, though, to be in that boat together with another teacher that you don't normally work with. Like, I feel like it's built a lot of uh, good relationships, like between teachers, like between fine arts and uh, core subject teachers. Like, because we're, if we're both uh, in an unknown situation, like we're both out of our comfort zone, I think it really does help with the collaborative angle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> now, before we take some questions, we were going to actually give you an opportunity to try connecting it. So when we like start out the year, like we'll have, you know, or, or before we start on each unit, we usually meet with the classroom teachers and kind of figure out like, well, what are some content standards that maybe they struggle with 
because we're all we're all there even me as a visual arts teacher right there's certain units that I you know I feel very strong when I'm teaching painting but I might feel a little bit weak when it comes to teaching fibers right so there's always some kind of like standard that you're like oh that one <laughs> and so like classroom teachers are the same way like some of them are very comfortable teaching math and others very comfortable teaching writing and so like if there are or some of them feel, don't feel comfortable at all teaching social studies oh yeah or, or like we have no time to or do history. don't care for social studies mm -hmm. and so like they will give us uh, some standards that maybe they are struggling to meet um and so we start with the content standard um and once we have that then it's kind of like perusing through all of the visual or you know fine art standards and try to find a match. And so what we're looking for is a natural alignment, just like two standards that seem pretty similar, like, oh, I could totally do something with that. Um, so over here on the content standard, we have uh, physical science, use tools and materials to design and build a device that uses light or sound to solve the problem of communicating over a distance. And then over here on the right, we have three possibilities of fine art standards that could work. And so my question is, is does anyone here see? I just was wondering if anyone wanted to chime in and uh, yeah, we'll give you a second to yeah, kind of think about it. give you a second it. to read over it and see which one you think uh, matches up the most naturally. And frankly, when we were doing this, uh, Steve had a different idea than I did, <clears throat> ironically. Yeah, well. All right. Yeah, we could go to the next one. OK. Do you want me to do it? Is everything still on? <laughs> OK, so. Are, are we putting it in the chat or? I don't know. Oh, yeah, you could put it in the chat or just, or just, uh, or just if people want to speak up, that's fine too. Um, I would be so scared. I'd be like, this one? <laughs> there really isn't a wrong answer here, honestly. Like if you think that it, it matches up. So we've also here, here we've got the, uh, the verbs all highlighted too, if that helps a little bit. So like- I have, oh. I interrupted somebody. No, I'm go sorry. ahead. Go ahead. Well, I have to say that in doing the exercise that that you said that C was felt like the the best fit, but I cannot stop thinking about A. That 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 just seems extraordinarily interesting to me. That if the answering a musical question if the question was how can you make them hear you <laughs> yeah. over yeah. there that that could be a really interesting thing but i'm perceiving that connection if we're going with just a straight like oh i like i think most people would see the alignment then i then i would say see that's yeah, what i'm yeah. thinking about right now Absolutely. i was drawn to a janelle but then I came into C secondarily. I'm, I'm struggling with B just because of the distance that you would have to cover um, and that you'd have to be able to discriminate. The idea that came to my mind for C was like flags in a battle situation, which were used to communicate troop movements and positions over distance, which involved um, materials and tools. And also, again, in a battle situation, the use of different bugle calls were used to direct folks over distance and communicate. Yeah, that's a great idea. Yikes. That's 
good. Yeah, I like that. Um, Any other thoughts? I kind of had the same idea with Phyllis, um, but then I also saw with C, which is a totally random, which kind of squirrel brain here. Um, if you look at C, I'm thinking like Apple because Apple and the aesthetics with their products, them being a work of art and very streamlined. So I know that's a random squirrel brain thing there, but going back to B, I'm picturing like the dances. It's like, you know how you talked about the flags and everything with C, I'm picturing like war dances and things like that, kind of a tribal dance with B and communicating that. Nice. Yeah, like I said, there's really no wrong answer. And like, you know, there there's a way that some of these kind of fit naturally together or some like, like C, yeah, C is just kind of like, the, but I think that's because I'm a visual arts person. I think if you're a different, if your specialty is different, you might see a different connection. Mm -hmm. So like when I looked at it, I was like, oh yeah, totally it's C. But then- But then you were like, but maybe it could be A. But it could be A. And and then like just hearing, yes, yeah, hearing some of your ideas, just talking through it, it's like, oh, well there, you know, I, th I think there's ways that, that it can work in different, you know, like for different people in different ways. Now, going back to B, we did have where we had something similar to this, where I gave my students time to design an item. They had to research it and design it. But what they came back to is like on B, how would you communicate if you were hearing impaired or vision impaired? And they mentioned specifically, would you have lights that would light up or how would they see the text? So I'm picturing that assignment that they took and kind of ran with on making it accessible for those that could not necessarily access immediate communication devices. Yeah. And so, yeah, now let me show you what I did. I just kind of like that convers this conversation, this conversation, honestly, like I'm getting a lot of great ideas. Not only <laughs> are, are we making the standard much more interesting, this is a first grade standard. And look at how these arts standards are going to elevate whatever you do, any of these. Um, now, this is what I ended up writing. I went with C. The students will create a work of art or design that uses light or sound to solve the problem of communicating over a distance. The student will explore types of materials and tools that they will use to design and build this work of art or design. And I was thinking of literally like a, a work of art. I don't know. I and, and here's the other thing. We aren't giving anybody a lesson. We're giving them an idea, a lesson seed. And just in this conversation, I've heard four different really interesting projects that could go from that. Like, yeah, all of those ideas could have easily, could easily be developed into a unit. So what if you, yeah, what yeah. if you were able to go to, back to uh, your teachers that you're collaborating with or something you're developing with, uh, with this supersized um, objective standard and say, let's explore this. And look, it's jelly rolled, like red, blue, red. It's just the visual shows that it can't be separated. Um, next time in April, what we wanted to do was do more of these maybe in groups. Um, and what I'd love to see is perhaps we could create um, a document, a living document of where we take some of these seeds and and put them out in the world, like on the maybe even on the Desu uh, website under arts integration, some of these supersized standards um, that could maybe excite people to try some of these projects to push a little bit further. And maybe this could be the beginning of that. And if we are in groups that maybe you are a, a, an art person, a visual arts person with a music person with a theater person and you can all collaborate and say hey I've got an objective here that might really work well here it means you got to dig into the objectives but what we're finding is it's so useful to us to make it more meaningful for what we're doing so that's what we were hoping to do in April I didn't tell Lauren about Lauren and Phyllis hey let's make an entire database but I think it could turn into something like that um, 
here is the Arts Integration Institute of Arts Integration. If you're interested in getting that certification, it's a year long process and we learned a whole bunch. And this was just the first step of it, what we're talking about now. That's how to get a hold of us. And do you guys have any other questions or thoughts you'd like to share? Where is this located? Um, well, it's all online, but it's, it's located in Maryland. Mm -hmm. So you didn't have to travel to Maryland to do this? You no. did it from no. your home? All online. Yeah, it was entirely online. And they do a, uh, they do a lot of online, um, even if you don't go uh, do the Institute, they have a, a wonderful summer and winter online, um, like, what is it? It's, it's like a, a workshop. It's a workshop and it's, they're very good. And they're all 15 minutes. They jam pack a bunch of information and then you go on to the next one. It's very practical. It's very practical. They have one right before the school year starts that I would highly recommend. And then they do one in winter where, student, where we as students actually presented at it. And it's an international thing. It's, it's known throughout the world, but it seems like it's kind of this hidden secret, but it's very, it's a very good program. I wonder if I saw you guys, I did the winter one during, <laughs> at one point I did the virtual workshop conference. We were in it last year. Okay. Maybe, maybe not. Very cool. Well, thank you so, so much for um, presenting today. It was really great. I think not only did you demonstrate a, a, a new and different way to look at how we can align the standards. I think for me, the visual of seeing the colors and then mixing them together in the jelly roll metaphor was like very, very helpful. Um, but I have to say too, I think just being able to all be on here and to have everybody's ideas, it shows the power of teacher collaboration in this instance as well and how um, there are mul multiple ways to look at this and to support each other. So um, thank you all for being here. I know we're like right at time. I just wanna share two quick things to wrap up. Um, like Katie and Steven said, they will be here again next month. So I hope you can come back. Um, please invite any other colleagues that you think would be interested. Um, like they said, it is gonna be much more hands-on um, and more collaborative and less of me talking. <laughs> um, and let me just, I wanna get you a quick survey. Um, all right, so if you um, do need or want a continuing ed certificate for participating today, um, please send me an email and I will be happy to get that to you. Um, Again, uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit. Um, we appreciate you as an individual ally coming to our meetings and supporting us um, and look forward to continued partnerships. I'm gonna drop in the chat just a real quick link of different um, opportunities in Missouri for professional learning, as well as free professional learning communities um, within our alliance. Um, so all of that is linked in the PDF I just shared with you. And again, thank you so much for coming. I'm going to drop just a quick survey. Um, any and all feedback you have, I do read through and look at them and try to make changes and adjustments um, from month to month. So thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Katie and Stephen. And we'll see you guys next month. Thank you very much. It was awesome. Thank you.